Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to what I think is going to be one of the more interesting meetings uh, that all of us have been to, if it goes well. And I know it will because of the amazing collection of intellects that are uh, collected here in this room. Uh, as we began planning for this uh, particular workshop, uh, we thought we ought to uh, try to achieve uh, a diversity of perspectives you know, that would be unlike most of the other meetings that any of us go to. And I think we've done that. Uh, given who all of you are and uh, the remarkable array of expertise that you represent. But I think the other aspect of this meeting that's going to make it different is its blue sky nature and that we really are asking all of you to think well outside the usual boundaries of a scientific workshop uh, or a, or a theme-specific meeting uh, into the future of where genomics uh, ought to be going in the course of the next decade or more. And that is a real opportunity, I think, uh, to take off the usual constraints and over the course of the next a couple of days uh, to really collectively see what we could come up with in the way of truly bold and exciting notions about what genomics uh, should become. And I mean genomics in the broadest sense, uh, genomics including all aspects of the biology and the medical uh, implications, the ethical, legal, and social issues, the technologies that need to be developed, the computational aspects, and a whole lot of other things too. So this is a very uh, large and challenging uh, agenda we have in front of us, but I think we have the right people to do it. And I think, as I will explain a little bit, the way in which this fits into a larger plan uh, to evolve a specific uh, set of proposals uh, means that we don't have to walk out of here on Friday uh, with a document all signed and sealed about what genomics will be you know, for the next few years. But I hope we'll be substantially closer to that than we are here this evening. What I thought I would do in this uh, opening, and I hope it won't be a terribly long presentation, uh, is to give a clear sense, or at least try to, about what we have done so far in the Genome Project, because I think there's a lot of people here who would not consider themselves genome scientists and may be not entirely clear about what the current efforts uh, have achieved. And obviously, we're going to be building upon that foundation, so it's probably good if we all uh, make it clear what the foundation currently looks like. Um, I am going to explain a bit about the context of all this in terms of how this meeting fits in with other things that are happening. And then I'm going to give you a charge about what it is that we hope to see happen uh, at this meeting and a bit about the logistics of uh, how that's all going to come about, which includes a few mysteries that won't yet be revealed. So that's, that's the intention for this evening. First of all, I'd like to express some sincere thanks to people that have helped very significantly in pulling this ambitious workshop together. In particular, the four people you see here who have been sort of the planning quartet from NHGRI, Eric Green, Mark Geyer, Kathy Hudson, and Elka Jordan, who have been working as a very effective group to try to plan out many of the details that got us here. I want to thank all the people who have agreed to give uh, talks in the plenary sessions tomorrow and those who have agreed to chair breakout sessions. And special thanks uh, because they've really worked uh, tirelessly uh, to the two people standing in the back there near the back door, uh, Karen Hages, and most especially to Susan Mix, uh, who have done incredible things to make this happen. I saw them uh, late last night uh, putting stickers on the back of uh, your identification tags, uh, so they were hard at work at the very last minute. Well, this is a cartoon uh, which came out right about the turn of the new millennium, and it's perhaps uh, an apt metaphor, one that many people have used, the notion that the Genome Project is an adventure, a biological adventure into new uncharted territory. The Human Genome Project here being compared to Lewis and Clark out there exploring uh, new territory. And we are called here the Lewis and Clark Expedition of the 21st Century. Well, the 21st Century is just getting going, and most of that expedition lies ahead of us. And I think the context here is for us to try to figure out collectively uh, what that looks like. Perhaps one could say that already the Genome Project has surveyed the territory called the human DNA sequence and got a pretty good idea of what its basic landmarks are. But if you want to see this uh, come to benefit humankind, uh, we still have most of the expedition ahead of us. So the Genome Project, of course, did not arise all of a sudden de novo one day. It came about because of a series of deliberative discussions, not unlike, I suppose, this one, uh, but happening uh, some years back. And some of you in the room were part of those, including uh, the person who will give our summary uh, tomorrow, or rather the next day, Maynard Olson, 
So let me bring you back, if I, I could, to 1988, uh, to the publication of this document, Mapping and Sequencing the Human Genome, uh, which was uh, the result of the Alberts panel. And it should be pointed out, though, that that set of recommendations, which basically then became the blueprint uh, for the Human Genome Project, didn't arise uh, immediately just out of that group's discussion, but was fed into by many other sources as well. So I'll come back to, I think in many ways, uh, we should think of ourselves now in a somewhat equivalent stage uh, where we have been operating on a series of five-year plans uh, which have been pretty much uh, built around those original recommendations. But as you'll see, most of those uh, specific goals have now been met. And so we're in a circumstance of really needing to think much more boldly and broadly about what genomic research should become in the future. So in that regard, this is unlike some of our preceding five-year planning meetings. As important as those were, this is probably even more so. A few of the milestones that were accomplished in the first 10 years of the Genome Project are illuminated here on this timeline, and I'm not going to go through uh, those because it would take too long and you're familiar with most of them. But just to point out that those also did not come about randomly, but as a result of having set a series of specific goals and aiming for certain timelines to be achieved and then challenging the scientific community to come forward and accomplish them, uh, which in every instance they did. And this is really uh, quite a notable record uh, of achievement uh, that many of you uh, were major parts of and which, of course, uh, we hope to see continuing. Oh, yeah, Nick, I guess that's sort of in the wrong place. Thank you for moving that. Uh, now, those particular goals came about, again, because of a planning process that identified them as desirable products. And just to run through what that looked like, the original five-year plan uh, published in 1991 uh, in this document, uh, which looks uh, very much like a government printing office uh, product, and, and in fact was, uh, went through the first five years of what we hope to achieve. That actually was supplanted only a couple of years later uh, by a five-year plan which covered the years 93 to 98, and you were all sent a copy of this one, uh, which was published in Science Magazine. And then, indeed, in 1998, the current five-year plan uh, published in Science went through a series of uh, very specific goals that we have been uh, looking at rather carefully ever since uh, as our guideline for what the scientific community felt would be the most important uh, and achievable uh, uh, goals over this five-year period. And I want to spend a little bit here talking about how we've done in that. I hope you had a chance to look at that article because I think it is instructive to see what it was that the best and brightest minds of the genome and non-genome community were able to come up with the last time we went through this process about what we thought we could accomplish. So there's a series of uh, quite a number of goals there, seven to be exact. And under each one of those, there are specific sub-goals. And I thought it would be useful to look and see how we've done. So under human DNA sequencing, when this was published in October 1998, we said that we would have finished uh, to the uh, standards uh, defined by the Genome Project, which are pretty rigid and strict, 33% of the genome by uh, the end of 2001. In fact, as of today, we have finished 61%. We said we would have a working draft of the genome by about now, and of course, as you know, that was generated a year and a half ago in June of 2000, although the publication describing that and the analysis of it came out last February. And we said we would complete the human genome, uh, again, to the definition of essential completeness, which is a rather specific one, uh, by December of 2003. We currently aim to do that by April of 2003, although, of course, that isn't here yet, so that's a prediction, not a current status in the strict sense of the word. And one of the specific uh, goals of the effort was to make sure that access was free and unrestricted, and we have adhered to that in, in every sense of the word, which I think has been a good thing for the scientific community. Just a couple of words about how we, did we do all of this, since it was a pretty significant effort, sort of like this proverb, which is to say uh, that it is important to understand the alphabet, and for DNA that means getting the sequence. And if you were paying attention uh, in March of 1999 and going to the Internet to see how far along things were, you would have seen about 15 percent of the sequence completed. And then over the course of the following months, uh, thanks to the efforts of 16 genome centers around the world and more than 2,000 people, uh, that those areas got filled in very nicely. And by May of 2000, uh, 90 percent of the sequence was, in fact, complete. 
Here is a photograph of the uh, uh, folks who assembled at Hingston Hall uh, in Cambridge a couple of years ago as part of that coordinated effort, uh, which you can immediately see is an international effort as well it should be. And I think this is something that has served the Genome Project extremely well from the beginning is its international character. And I would certainly argue whatever we decide to do next should have that same character. Uh, the genome, after all, belongs to all of us. This, of course, was the uh, copy of Nature back in February that described the sequencing and the initial analysis and uh, represented, I think, from the scientific perspective, the major milestone uh, being, as it was, a peer-reviewed publication with a great deal of input from some very bright people who helped us analyze the sequence, uh, many of whom are here with us at this meeting. And in case you have heard that there's a picture of Watson Crick buried somewhere in this mosaic, but you haven't found it yet, I'm going to spare you a little trouble. It's right down there. Uh, speaking of Watson and Crick, I think uh, there is a reason, perhaps, why we have chosen this April 2003 uh, time point uh, as the projection of finishing uh, the, all of the chromosomes uh, to the same standards that have already been achieved for 22 and 21 and a few others uh, that are also uh, now uh, getting wound up and, and written up. Uh, and in fact, there is sort of a poetic appeal of that because that will be the 50th anniversary of this uh, very significant one-page paper uh, in Nature, April 25th, 1953, when Watson and Crick described the structure of DNA. And as part of the 50th anniversary of that in April of 2003, we expect to also be able to say the human genome sequence is now finished. And we are on track to do that. I, I would like to assure anybody who is concerned that after all of the hullabaloo of announcing working drafts and publications that the sequencing centers might have sort of lost interest in this, they certainly have not, and many of them are here and can assure you of that, that they're working their butts off uh, to get this job finished, closing up those gaps, uh, dealing with the messy areas that didn't go so easily the first time through. And as we track uh, the closing of the gaps and the completing of the sequence, uh, the whole effort is very much on track to achieve that completion by spring of 2003. So that's the sequence goal. What about sequencing technology? That was the second goal that is enumerated in the 1998 plan. Uh, in fact, it's very interesting to go back and read that. And we said, and we thought this was extremely bold, that by 2003, uh, we should be able to finish 500 megabases a year of sequence uh, we're currently, uh, by my estimates, uh, our Mark Geyer is going through all of the efforts, all of the data that's been accumulated from the genome centers, uh, finishing about 1,400 megabases a year. The cost for a finished base pair in 98 was 50 cents. And it seemed as though it might get stuck there for a little while. And so projecting that we could get it down to a quarter by 2003 was not a projection that everybody bought into, but it was put down anyway. Well, look how we did. The current cost of a finished base pair is about nine cents, uh, which is obviously responsible for the fact that we've been able to do so much sequencing in that interval. And novel technologies, that is, uh, instead of uh, continuing the very effective, but perhaps uh, ultimately not cheap enough uh, methods of capillary electrophoresis uh, sequencing instruments, um, you're going to see in a couple of these slides that I've just put down support because the way we worded the 98 plan was a bit vague. It says we should work on this. Uh, and of course, we have worked on it. So in my report on the status, I'm going to say it's progressing. But you could obviously pin me down a bit here uh, as to whether we've actually achieved uh, what we aim to. And in some instances, I would say it's gone faster, in other cases, slower. And maybe that's one of the lessons for this group as we begin to talk about planning for the future as, more, as specific as we can be, and then we'll know if we succeeded or not. Uh, I'll just show you one example of a novel technology for sequencing that I thought was pretty cool uh, that David Burke uh, showed to me a couple of weeks ago when I was visiting Ann Arbor. Uh, so this is a, a sequencing instrument, a model, a pilot model. Uh, David will tell you it doesn't quite have the resolution that he would hope for. Uh, here's the actual thing in my hand so you can get a uh, sense of the size of it. So that's obviously a little smaller than a 3700. Uh, and it obviously can uh, therefore operate with very small volumes. And all the various components, including running the reactions and doing the separations, are built into this chip. Uh, most of what you see here are just the connections in order to allow you to hook it up the way you want to. That kind of micro-electromechanical systems approach uh, has clearly been an exciting one, but it's been a challenge uh, to reduce that uh, to anything approaching practice, and that challenge uh, is still remaining to be fully met, but one that one would hope would continue uh, to yield up a promise of increasing throughput and reducing cost, uh, which if we want to see sequencing happen in a truly prodigious way, we have to continue to see that curve uh, move in, in a beneficial way. 
The goals for human variation, uh, by the way, there were no goals for human variation in 1993, and that was not part of the original uh, uh, specific plan for the Genome Project, uh, as I read it, although it was sort of expected it would come along somewhat after that. Uh, so the, the goals in 98, which were uh, uh, at the time rather ambitious, were to support technology for SNP discovery. And I think what we've learned is that the most efficient way for the human to discover SNPs right now is to use the fact that you have the sequence and simply do shotgun sequencing from other individuals. And you find lots and lots of SNPs that way, and of course they're mapped because the sequence is there to lay them against. Technology for SNP scoring was to be supported, and I think it's fair to say there's been a proliferation of ways to approach that, and, but I would not say at the moment that there's been a clear winner in terms of the uh, competitive nature of these, and they're all still way too expensive, uh, so it's not clear that we've fully succeeded at that, although there's been a lot of technology development. There is one goal here that I would say we have not achieved, and uh, by 2003 we may, or depending on what the, the scientific plans are for the next uh, year or so, uh, we may decide that we can get the same information without specifically going after this. This was the goal of trying to identify the common variants in coding regions of most genes. And we have a modest fraction of the genes for that has been done, but for the most part, the focus on developing variants has been uh, done in a random fashion without focusing specifically on the gene. And that may be something that people at this meeting will end up talking about, for all I know. The SNP map, we thought this was really ambitious, that we'd go for 100,000 SNPs by 2003. We now have about 3 million, and again, that came about because of technological improvements, and particularly because of having the sequence uh, to lay uh, those random reads against. And then we argued that we needed public resources of cell lines, and uh, those have been supported, in particular, the PDR, the Polymorphism Discovery Resource, this collection of cell lines that's been used by many groups, uh, including the SNPs Consortium, that has been responsible for a very large fraction uh, of the SNPs that are out there now in dbSNP. Uh, that is a, uh, a cell line a resource that I think has turned out to be quite useful. And there are others as well that have been collected or in the process of being collected. So human variation has come along, I think, more quickly than most people expected. Uh, one can go, for instance, uh, to the web and pull out a couple thousand base pairs of sequence, as you see here on chromosome 7. And if you look in that same region, if it happens to be in one that's been uh, well mined, well, goodness, you're likely to find SNPs in the same area, nicely placed on the, the sequence, waiting there for you to assess their significance. But assessing their significance is not so straightforward. And we have had intense discussions over the last a year or so about whether there would be ways uh, to facilitate the process of doing whole genome associations, where you scan the entire genome looking to see, can you identify SNPs that are associated with a particular phenotype? And of course, to do that, looking at every SNP in the genome is going to be prohibitively expensive with current technology. But if you could identify a subset that basically give you all of the information, because they are, after all, correlated with their neighbors uh, because of this thing called linkage disequilibrium, you could save a lot of time and money. And that is the uh, reason uh, for a project that's now very intensely under discussion uh, to build a haplotype map for the human genome and basically define once and for all all of the common haplotypes, that is, all of the blocks of DNA where the SNPs are in disequilibrium with each other, uh, and to do so in a fashion that then allows you to pick a subset of the total number of SNPs, hopefully only a modest subset, a subset that you could score, perhaps a couple hundred thousand, uh, and then use those uh, to carry out your whole genome association studies. Uh, this effort has been intensely discussed uh, since last summer when we held a major workshop on the topic, and it's beginning to take shape uh, as an exciting new opportunity. Goal number four, uh, technology development for functional genomics. If you looked at the 98 plan, you would notice it's a bit on the vague side here because we wanted to support things here, but we weren't very specific about in what way. And here is an area I suspect where people at this meeting uh, will focus uh, more heavily than we did uh, five or three or four years ago uh, because at that point it wasn't quite clear what functional genomics was going to turn out to be. You'll notice that uh, technology was used in this particular instance because we weren't sure that we wanted to advocate for a collection of large data sets at that point. But now I suspect some of you may very well want to advocate for such uh, large data sets. The only specific thing I want to draw your attention to that you might not be aware of, which actually fills, I think, rather nicely uh, this need for cDNA resources, along with a number of other uh, such resources that have been generated uh, by groups like Recon. Uh, the mammalian gene collection, uh, which is an NIH effort, which has been contributed to by a number of NIH institutes, 
and uh, has been uh, led until recently uh, by Rick Klausner and myself. And now that he has uh, gone off to another position, it's still a joint effort uh, of NHGRI and NCI, and Bob Strasberg is serving as the czar of this enterprise. And if you look at the output of this, it's actually getting pretty exciting. Uh, there are more than 8,000 human full-length cDNAs that have been produced, and an expectation that that will grow rapidly. And there are a number of people in the room that are part of this uh, challenging and ambitious uh, multi-center effort to try to generate a full-length cDNA uh, for all human and mouse genes over the course of the next uh, few months to a year or two. And it will be interesting to see how that develops. And obviously, that is a resource uh, that many people had hoped uh, to find uh, in their hands, and which is increasingly so. These clones are available not only as sequence, but as actual clones that you can order and use in experiments. I can tell you, by the way, <coughs> if you're looking for a cDNA for a gene that's known to be involved in disease, uh, there's about 900 genes, uh, by my count, uh, that appear in OMIM as being re responsible for a disease that Victor McCusick considers uh, to be genetic. Well, of those 900 genes, 91% of them now have a full-length cDNA in this collection. So if you're out there busting your butt trying to get that five prime end of that gene that's making you crazy, you can probably spare yourself the trouble and simply order up the clone. Goal number five, comparative genomics. Uh, the goals that were placed in the 98 plan uh, were we thought ambitious, but actually a lot more has been done than what we initially imagined at that point, in part because sequencing has come along so nicely. The C. elegans sequence was supposed to get finished in 1998, and it certainly was. Uh, and now we have underway as a joint effort of WashU and the Sanger Center a uh, sequencing of C. Briggsy, a companion roundworm. Uh, with expectation that the comparison between the two is going to be tremendously valuable in terms of understanding which parts of the genome are functional and getting the gene models right. Uh, Drosophila melanogaster aimed for 2002, uh, got done, as you all know, as a uh, wonderful collaboration between Jerry Rubin and Solera uh, with the uh, data being published in March of 2000. And we now see about to start a companion uh, Drosophila, namely Pseudo obscura, uh, which has uh, potentially the same value as I just mentioned for the roundworm in terms of providing annotation information uh, that will really help a lot in understanding which parts of the genome are doing what. The mouse, uh, what we said in 98 was that we were going to aim for a draft, but it doesn't say exactly when we'd have that, and that we'd try to have a complete sequence by 2005. In fact, and I'm not sure everybody is as fully aware of this as you might be, because much of this data has appeared in the last couple of months. Uh, right now, if you go to uh, the uh, databases, both as traces and as sequence, you can find about 5.5x coverage of uh, the black 6 strain of mouse. The uh, goal of finishing uh, still says 2005. It may be that that can be beaten, but we haven't officially said so. Uh, by the way, uh, there is this new publication, uh, which you can find in several places, but it's on the NIH site uh, on the mouse page. Uh, this Mouse Genome Monthly is an effort to try to keep people up to date on what's happening uh, with the Mouse Genome Sequencing Consortium effort, uh, which is jointly uh, carried out uh, by the Sanger Center, Washington University, uh, Whitehead, uh, and the EBI folks who are handling uh, most of the informatics. Uh, and this uh, particular issue, number one, which just came out, uh, contains within it this diagram here, uh, which uh, is a description of what you can expect to see as far as the a mouse a sequencing effort over the course of the next little bit. And as you know, we're sort of here in late 2001, so we are essentially at the point of having this 5 to 6x shotgun. Assemblies have already been undertaken, and some of them are now available uh, if you want to go to the uh, EBI site. Uh, and annotation of that is also getting underway. And then in 2002, uh, there will be a heavy effort devoted uh, to back-by-back -back sequencing in order to achieve a finished uh, mouse genome. There's also an effort, as you can see here, uh, to carry out some sequencing of additional strains in order to generate uh, a nice collection of SNPs that should be very useful uh, for people who are trying uh, to map various phenotypes on back crosses. So I think it's fair to say the mouse effort is considerably further along than we would have contemplated in 1998. There are other large-scale animal sequencing projects uh, that are also underway and uh, going quite well. And I think, again, as one goes through this, uh, you realize what a prodigious expansion there has been in sequencing capacity in these last three years. Because in 98, we thought we were stretching pretty hard uh, to make the projections that were made. And yet, not only have things been exceeded as far as human and mouse, but these other things are heavily underway. RAT has now uh, reached about 2x coverage uh, as I uh, look at the uh, traces appearing uh, in the trace repository at NCBI. 
uh, this being a joint effort uh, between uh, Richard Gibbs, who oversees uh, the project, along with collaborators at Solera and at uh, Genome Therapeutics. Uh, zebrafish being done at Sanger, and I'm sorry if I don't quite have the coverage right, because I did this in a hurry a little bit ago, and I didn't have a chance to go and look, but I, I gather it's about 1x. Uh, Tetra Odin, uh, an effort that Jean Weissenbach has been working on uh, for some time, which has been a very useful uh, set of data for annotating the human genome. Uh, now at about 6x coverage, I believe, uh, with some of that data more recently being supplied also by Whitehead. Uh, the uh, uh, joint effort uh, led by the JGI uh, to sequence the pufferfish fugu uh, was announced uh, recently as having reached about 5 to 6x coverage as well. And Siona Savigny, uh, which is a sea squirt, uh, being sequenced at the Whitehead uh, is now, uh, the sequence is present at about 10x coverage and is the process of being assembled. So there's a lot of stuff here, and uh, if you're interested in doing comparative sequence analysis, uh, you have large databases to work with, but obviously we want them to be even larger if you're going to learn the most that you can uh, from Evolution's lab notebook. I have not made separate slides for goals 6, 7, and 8 from the 98 plan because when you look at those particular goals, they're extremely important, and I hope nobody will take it because I've put them here together on one slide that I'm saying they're less important. Let's get that straight. Uh, the ELSI part of our goals uh, was in 98, I would guess, it, I would uh, venture to say, probably the most important part, and I think it may very well be true this time as well. But they don't uh, perhaps lend themselves uh, to tabulation in quite the same way as how many bases you're going to finish or what your cost for base pair is going to be. So I refer you back to the document to read through those uh, particular recommendations in these three areas, and I will expect that this meeting uh, will also tackle those in significant ways uh, in particular because uh, we've kind of arranged it that way by having some breakout groups uh, to talk about uh, several of these topics. Well, okay, that's where we are now. Now let's talk about where we need to get to. Uh, I like this cartoon because it feels this way on certain days uh, if you're in the lab trying to understand what the genome is telling you. Uh, three billion pieces, and what exactly does it all mean? And I think that really is the challenge that now lies ahead of us, which I hope this meeting will address. How do we take where we are, which is a remarkable moment in history with this incredible array of fantastically interesting data that we don't understand very well, and really move it forward into the applications to biology and medicine that were the reason uh, for the doing the project in the first place. Now, obviously, many of those applications are already happening, and uh, hooray for that. But let's talk about, over the next couple of days, how we can speed that process up. Uh, of course, uh, a very major aspect of that is the application to medicine. How are we going to take those discoveries about the genome, identify the genes that are playing a role in disease susceptibility, use that information for diagnostics, preventive medicine, pharmacogenomics, and develop better therapies. This diagram that I'm fond of showing is one that isn't going to happen without a lot more creative ideas and effort going into the process of moving from top to bottom. And how, in fact, are we collectively going to ensure that that happens at the maximum speed? Because that's what the public is waiting for and deserves. And in the midst of all that, how do we do that in a fashion that is sensitive uh, to all of the other issues that surround the study of the genome and its applications? Uh, this quote from Albert Schweitzer might very well be the motto of the ELSI program. We must not allow our technology to exceed our humanity. Uh, how are we going to achieve that in a responsible fashion? Well, your job is to be predictors then. <laughs> and I have to tell you, you're taking on a risky task. Somebody insists that this was really said by Yogi Berra, but I have it on good authority uh, that if he said it, he wasn't the only one. So, yeah, we are asking you to do something pretty unusual here. Uh, and scientists aren't necessarily known for sticking their necks too far out when it comes to trying to think 10 or 15 or 20 years ahead. But that is very much the intent of this meeting. Uh, and I will tell you that it hasn't always gone well uh, when other people have made an effort to do that, and some of them have been fairly distinguished. For instance, uh, this quotation uh, I found uh, by a fairly well-known person, uh, Thomas Watson, by the way, who happened to be chairman of IBM. I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. We wouldn't have said anything like that, would we? Uh, another quotation, the concept is interesting and well-formed, but in order to earn better than a C, the idea must be feasible. So who said that? Yale professor evaluating Fred Smith's paper, which proposed, proposed FedEx, which Fred Smith went on to found and obviously did pretty well. Uh, so yeah, right, academic criticism at this meeting may be taken with a grain of salt as well. 
we need to be uh, bold here and, and not uh, put down great ideas just because they don't fit our models. Uh, another quote, we don't like their sound and guitar music is on the way out. Sort of a timely quote for the past uh, week or so. Decca Records rejecting the Beatles in 1962. Uh, final one, who do you suppose said this? 640K ought to be enough for anybody. Bill Gates. <laughs> so as you're thinking about sequencing capacity, don't make this mistake. Okay, so our charge is to do better than that, but it's going to be hard. Uh, of course, the best way to be sure you're right is to create the future, and then uh, it'll happen the way you intended it to, and you'll appear to be incredibly bright. Let me put this now uh, in the uh, last few minutes here into context of uh, what the planning process is, because I think you deserve to have some notion of how this meeting fits into an overall scheme that actually has already begun, uh, began uh, back last spring, and will play out over the course of about the next year, at the end of which we hope to have something that looks like a plan uh, for what NHGRI uh, should be doing uh, for the next uh, five or ten years. So. The purpose is to develop this plan. It says five years here, but I'm not wedded to that at all. Uh, there may be a reason why five years made sense in the previous iterations of this, and that reason may no longer apply. So that's something that could be factored into our discussions. But we do need to have this plan in place, uh, I would say, by the spring of 2003, when the human genome sequence is essentially completed. Uh, then many of the goals uh, that were already uh, on our table will have been dealt with, and we look sort of silly if we don't have something else uh, to offer up as a substitute. So I wouldn't want this to go on much longer than that. Um, we need a, a, a vision, of course. Uh, the process has already begun in a fashion that includes the entire institute. And most of you who are here uh, may not be entirely familiar with the fact that there's a difference philosophically between the extramural and the intramural uh, aspect of NHGRI. So let me quickly say a word about that. The extramural program has been around since the beginning, uh, when we were still a center. It is the place where we spend most of our resources. Uh, the intramural program was founded in 1994 and was specifically aimed uh, to try to uh, study applications of genomics to disease, taking advantage of the aspects uh, of uh, bench to bedside that are particularly able to, uh, possible to achieve on the NIH campus with the clinical center, which is uh, this remarkable place that has more than half of the uh, clinical research beds in the, in the country. Uh, so the intramural effort has been more applied. You have amongst you this evening a number of folks uh, from the intramural program uh, who are branch chiefs. You have a number of other folks who are on our board of scientific counselors who advise that program. And we think it's uh, particularly appropriate this iteration uh, that we do this planning process jointly because as time goes on, I think the difference uh, between the extramural program, which was focused on the goals of the genome project, and the intramural program focused on the applications are beginning to get closer together. Furthermore, uh, the LC effort, uh, the research program, has been part of our planning process each time. But we have a policy operation in the Genome Institute, which is in my office, in the director's office, which is directed by Kathy Hudson, which is our Office of Policy and Public Affairs, which has been in, in very much involved in the rough and tumble business of trying to take research conclusions and seeing if they can be actually be implemented at the policy level. And we felt very much this year that that process ought to also be connected uh, with the planning. And so, in fact, they are. So we have these three components, uh, each one of which has an ad hoc working group of our advisory council uh, to oversee them, but these are all interlocked uh, by the fact that they have uh, some shared members and they all report to the advisory council of NHGRI. Just to quickly tell you who those people are, uh, most of them are at this meeting, so you will see them in your breakout groups and in the hallway and at lunch. Uh, here are the folks uh, on the council who are assigned to our extramural planning group. Uh, they are all members of our council. Here are the folks who have agreed to serve on our intramural planning group. As you can see, a number of them are members of our board of scientific counselors, which is the body that oversees the intramural program. And a couple of them, uh, Raju and Janet, are, are members of the uh, advisory council. And then we have some other folks as well, like Carl Barrett and Jim Batty, uh, who are scientific directors or institute directors uh, for NIH. And then the policy LC group, uh, you can see the folks uh, who are listed there. Uh, this is a uh, vigorous group of uh, folks who actually met this afternoon. I uh, had a very uh, useful and, a, and uh, important gathering from what I've learned. 
And uh, this also includes, as you can see, three members, or sorry, four members of our council and one of the Board of Scientific Counselors. So those are who those people are, and they're charged with assisting us in pulling this all together uh, so that by uh, the spring of 2003, uh, we have a blueprint that everybody uh, feels has made the most uh, of all of these uh, creative folks. Now, what have we already done? I said the process had begun. Here is a listing of workshops that have already happened, uh, and uh, the last of which is uh, the one you're right now uh, starting here this evening. Uh, these have focused on a variety of topics, a minority training workshop back in April, a workshop on protein sequence databases in May uh, that we held jointly with the uh, NLM, uh, a joint sequence assembly workshop which was looking at whole genome shotgun versus back-based sequencing, which we held jointly with Solera, a comparative genome sequencing workshop in July, out of which came a recommendation about how we should try to prioritize additional genomes uh, for, for large-scale sequencing. I didn't mention that when I was going through the comparative genomics. I might say one word about it right now. There is now a process which involves a white paper that needs to be put together by an investigator or a scientific community or a sequencing center or some combination of those who are interested in seeing a particular genome get into the queue for large-scale sequencing. And then there's a review process to try to look at those documents and assess uh, the relative values based upon the size of the community and the value of the information. Uh, and then as sequencing capacity becomes available in the centers that have it, we'll try to slot these new genome sequences into that uh, particular pipeline. Uh, and if you want to know more about that process, uh, you might want to talk to Bill Gelbart, who's standing in the back, because uh, he's going to have uh, a very important role in overseeing uh, the review, so you can start lobbying him anytime you want. Uh, the Human Variation Haplotype Map Project, I, I mentioned this SIM map idea, and this very much uh, got a, a thorough airing in a public meeting in July, out of which have come uh, several working groups that have been working out the details. And that discussion continues, and I'm sure uh, will come up in various uh, forms uh, during these couple of days, but it actually has acquired a lot of momentum. Uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, interest in haplotypes in both the public and the private sector, and we have representatives here at the meeting uh, who are interested in that from the private pe sector perspective as well. In fact, I should say we're fortunate that we have a broad diversity of perspectives at this whole meeting. Not everybody here uh, wears an academic hat or a private sector hat. Some people wear both, and that's as it should be. Uh, we had a, a meeting in October to talk about behavioral and social factors and their interaction with genetics uh, that had some interesting suggestions about possible research opportunities. We had an additional sort of a follow-up uh, to the April meeting uh, just a week ago uh, in, in where all of our grantees uh, came for a further discussion about how we could improve our outreach uh, to minorities uh, in training in genomics. And then here you are in this public meeting on the future of genomics, which is obviously a large and much broader kind of meeting than the workshops that have preceded. Now, out of this meeting, we hope to get a broad sense of what some of the most exciting opportunities are that we haven't necessarily attended to yet. And so we would expect then to hold additional topic-specific workshops uh, in 2002. There are some of these that are already under consideration, but you shouldn't be constrained in your thinking by that. We uh, expect that we'll probably hold a large-scale protein analysis or a proteomics meeting uh, together with the General Medical Sciences Institute and the NCI uh, sometime in the next few months. The plans for that are already uh, coming along. Uh, there is an intention uh, to consider a large-scale uh, gene expression or expression array meeting uh, to talk about opportunities in that area. Uh, many people have been excited with the sequence coming along as well as it is and other aspects of chromosome biology uh, desperately seeking explanation that this might be a great opportunity uh, to talk about that topic. Uh, we clearly need to do more about databases and particularly the idea of having databases for model organisms where you don't reinvent it each time uh, has a lot of appeal and there is an effort underway to organize a meeting of that sort. Uh, we'd have some rough plans for a meeting of uh, the ELSI group on race and ethnicity in genetics research. <coughs> and then, next fall, we would aim, probably again, back here at Early House, to convene a similarly large and broad group. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a bit of a bug. Uh, with the intention at that point of having a much more mature uh, expectation of what our plan might look like. And at that point, the meeting would be much more devoted to reviewing what that draft uh, seems to be looking like and trying to tell us whether we've got it right or whether we've missed some important things. 
So that's the uh, basic outline. But again, I would hope that we will fill in some other ideas here. Thank you. <coughs> for, for other workshops. As a consequence of your deliberations, because I'm sure there are other topics that need to be fleshed out a lot more than we'll be able to do in just these two days. There are a couple of meta, meta issues that might be also talked about either uh, specifically in the breakouts or at uh, lunches or breakfasts or whatever. Uh, I guess one is, does it doesn't make sense to have these five-year plans anymore. Well, it, does it, is it appropriate to have a systematic, uh, regularly occurring planning process? I think it'd be hard to argue that that's a bad idea, but what's the right time interval? And is it appropriate to do it in this global way as opposed to topic by topic? And a semantic question that actually is pretty important, I think, for us all to decide on. What was the Human Genome Project and is it over? If you look at the original definition, and I think it is the definition that most people have kind of attached themselves to, by 2003, it's essentially going to be over because the goals that were laid out by that National Academy panel will essentially have been achieved. And it may be a little embarrassing. I mean, the other alternative is to say, well, yeah, but it evolved and we came up with some other topics. But are we really going to say 40 years from now when we still don't entirely understand the genome that we're still doing the Human Genome Project? And if we're not going to say it 40 years from now, well, what is the natural point to sort of make the juncture and say, okay, the Genome Project is completed. Let's have a victory celebration. And now what we're doing is genome research. Well, that's a labeling issue, but it's an important one. It's probably one that would be useful to have some broad discussion and even an international kind of sense of consensus <coughs> before we make a conclusion. Uh, one of my pet peeves is that we ought to get rid of the word post-genome era because that won't serve us very well if we're spending all this time talking about how to understand the genome. <coughs> Maybe we've been in the pre-genome era, but uh, we certainly are not in the post-genome era. We're finally in the genome era, and we're going to be here for quite a while. Okay, well, winding down, uh, let me give you some specific charges and information. What is it that we're asking you to do? I hope you had a chance to read the email that came around about a week ago uh, that enumerates uh, what we had in mind in bringing you to this meeting, and I'll just uh, hit a couple of the bullets. We really want you to reach beyond the usual horizon of a grant cycle, <laughs> which is the way often people are forced to think. So that means thinking to five or 10 or 15 years, not three. And of course, in the grant cycle, when you think about three years, uh, you're really writing about the stuff you already did and uh, writing it as if you hadn't done it already. And that thinking is not what we're after here either. Uh, I think we all kind of know what we've done and where we are now. And the intention of this meeting is really to get out there beyond that usual limit of the horizon and imagine where we want to be and how to get there. And that's what we've asked our speakers tomorrow morning to do, each one of them, is to imagine themselves in 2020 uh, in their area and what they hope genomics will look like, and then to think backward from that about what we should have done in order to get there. And I think if we adopt that same attitude in our discussions uh, throughout the meeting, it will be useful. That also means, of course, getting outside of uh, the other kinds of uh, constraints, thinking boldly, expansively, uh, out of the box has become such a cliche. I was tempted not to put it on the slide at all, but you know what I mean, out of the box. Uh, we need to identify new areas uh, that maybe haven't been discussed by anybody so far, but that are ripe for exploration, even in a high-risk way. But this shouldn't exclude familiar areas that have been sort of moving along okay, but could really take a leap forward uh, with an ambitious new approach. Now, very important, do not worry at this meeting at all about how the ideas that we come up with are going to be supported or by whom. That's not the intention of this part of the process. We'll get there. We'll have to get there because by spring of 2003, we have to have a blueprint for what the National Human Genome Research Institute is supposed to be doing over the course of the next few years. But I don't want that to bother you in the slightest in, in these discussions. Uh, clearly, there are many players uh, in the future of genomics research. Uh, there is the NIH, and there are many other institutes at NIH represented here at this meeting who have major stakes in genomics. Uh, there's the Department of Energy, and our colleagues from DOE are here as well. Uh, there is private industry, both biotech and pharmaceuticals. And of course, there's the international community, a very critical part of the whole endeavor. And ultimately, we'll have to sort of sort out about who is best positioned to take on which part of the plan. But I don't think that that should be a ne by necessity 
a, a part of the conversation in the next couple of days. Uh, don't worry about that so much. And I would encourage you, as you're having these discussions, although the breakout groups tomorrow afternoon are going to be topic specific in the same way that the uh, opening plenaries are, uh, try not to be too narrow, though, if you're debating a particular goal in the medical arena. It, it would be good to think about its LC consequences and its technology consequences and its training consequences if you can manage to do so, uh, so that we don't get too compartmentalized. Uh, we will make sure not to be compartmentalized uh, tomorrow evening by mixing this up a bit, and I'll explain that in a minute. So that's the, the basic idea of the way in which we hope the meeting will progress. Now some practical matters. Uh, you may notice there are some cameras uh, in the room and uh, lights that are making it rather warm up here. Uh, the plenary sessions are being videotaped and will be webcast, and that was our intent because many people could not come to the meeting who wanted to because uh, this particular venue is limited to about 180 people. Uh, and particularly our colleagues at NIH, many of them, uh, were interested in being able to see uh, the proceedings by webcast, and that's what the uh, videos are about. This is a public meeting. This is not a closed meeting. There are some members of the press uh, present, uh, so you should uh, consider this as fully an open meeting, which is just the way we like to do things. Uh, you want to, right now, uh, take off your name tag, if you haven't already, and look on the back of it, because uh, there's some useful information there that's going to tell you something about what, how you spend tomorrow afternoon and evening. Uh, there should be two tags on there. Uh, one says afternoon breakout group, and one says evening. The afternoon breakout group uh, should specifically identify a place and a topic uh, that you're supposed to uh, uh, repair to at about 3.30 tomorrow afternoon. Uh, people have already asked me, do they have to go to the one they were assigned to? Well, it would really be nice if you did, uh, <laughs> because we made some effort here to try to mix people up in a fashion uh, that put strength in the area uh, of the topic in the room, but also had other perspectives, so it just it wasn't all the geeks in one particular theme that got together. And, and if you decide to reselect yourselves, it, it might increase the titer of experts and decrease uh, the titer of generalists, and that would be too bad. So uh, if you can, please uh, stick to the assignment. Now, the evening breakout group you may be wondering about, because uh, there is a room there for everybody, uh, but it probably says mystery group something, one, two, three, et cetera. So what's that all about? Well, we thought it would be uh, a good thing to have the evening groups be cross-cutting topics that were not specific to one of the theme areas that are going to be presented during the morning tomorrow. Uh, and uh, yet at the same time, we weren't exactly sure what those optimum cross-cutting topics might be because we haven't had tomorrow afternoon yet. So um, e there are going to be folks in each of those uh, breakout groups in the afternoon uh, from NHGRI listening to the discussion, particularly paying attention to whether there are uh, examples of topics that seem like they're ripe for that kind of cross-cutting further investigation. And uh, we will ask uh, the uh, breakout group leaders uh, to get together uh, for what's been called the dinner from hell uh, tomorrow, <laughs> where in the course of a rather short period of time, uh, we will try to figure out what those topics are and also who would be an appropriate leader. And so don't be surprised if sometime during dinner tomorrow somebody comes and taps you on the shoulder <laughs> It says, guess what? The topic that we've decided would make a great breakout group is the following, and we'd like to ask you to lead the discussion. And I hope you'll be willing to do that and not go running for the room or avoid dinner altogether, because that would be unfortunate. <laughs> uh, I'd like to reassure you that you will be given uh, access uh, to uh, staff people who will help you through this, uh, so it shouldn't be too painful. I'd also like to reassure you that we do have in our back pocket uh, some topics in case nobody thinks of any, so that we're certain that we do have evening breakout groups, but we're not going to tell you what those topics are. Anyway, th this should be a, a fun part of the occasion. I suspect by tomorrow evening people will be a little punchy uh, after a rather intense day, and this should be an opportunity uh, to really uh, try something a bit different. Um, I would like to ask that at the conclusion of this presentation, and yes, we're almost done, uh, all the plenary speakers for tomorrow and the afternoon breakout group leaders uh, meet up here at the front with me and a few of the other staff uh, to be sure we've all got our signals straight. And I would also, as far as a practical matter, I'd like to tell you the Whistling Swan Pub, which is over in the silo house, uh, will be open this evening and uh, tomorrow evening as well until 11.30, and it's a nice place to unwind and uh, meet with your colleagues. And I hope you will take advantage of the other aspect of this meeting, which is the diversity of attendees, uh, to find out something about uh, what people are doing who are not necessarily the folks that you talk to every day 
And when you go to the pub or when you sit at breakfast or lunch, uh, mix with some folks that are not of your own discipline. I don't want to see all the techies at one table and all the LC people at another. It's not like I'm talking to a bunch of campers, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so again, coming back to the charge here, I want to think, ha have you think about what's happening here as far as this process that I've outlined that is going to emerge in the spring of 2003 with a new blueprint for genomics. Is perhaps has more in common with what the National Academy panel did 13 years ago than with what happened five years ago when we were working out the details of how to accomplish uh, the goals of the Genome Project, goals that had been, uh, for the most part, already established but had to be uh, put into specific terms of timetables, uh, costs, deliverables, and so on. We really have the opportunity now to rewrite this book, and I think that's a fantastic intellectual experience uh, and one that I'm looking forward uh, to very much. Uh, in that regard, I guess I should leave you with a quotation since I've already left you with several. This is my favorite quote uh, for people who are trying to do uh, difficult things as far as looking into the future uh, from somebody who's not Dan Quayle, but somebody who's a rather accomplished athlete. And this is a quote that uh, Arnie Levine used once, actually in one of our planning meetings a few years ago. It's from Wayne Gretzky. This is what we all want to do. Skate where the puck is going to be, and not where it is right now. That won't help very much, although it's a good thing to know that. The goal of this meeting is skate where it's going to be a few years from now, and then we will have succeeded. Thank you all very much.